This week's General Synod addressed everything from the increasing violence in Nigeria to the state of the health service, from the debate on assisted dying to reform of the House of Lords. But it was the vexed issue of women bishops that dominated proceedings. A compromise is on the table which would require diocesan bishops to provide an alternative male bishop for parishes opposed to female oversight. But that's not enough for some, because the male bishop would still be acting under the authority delegated from a woman. Gavin Drake's report from the front lines of an embattled church begins with Father David Holding, leader of the Catholic group on the Synod. To the measure, to the law, that will give us bishops that we can recognise as bishops in the apostolic succession. That means um, male bishops consecrated and ordained by a college of male bishops. This will preserve our integrity in the life of the church. Over the past year, the draft legislation was approved by 42 out of 44 dioceses, well above the 50% needed to become law, and it will come back to Synod for final approval in July. The legislation can still be amended at this stage, but only by the House of Bishops. And this week, Synod members debated a motion from the Diocese of Manchester, calling on the bishops to give greater legal protection to traditionalists. But the bishops themselves are split about what to do. The Archbishop of York, Dr John Sentamu, says the legislation must change to ensure it protects those who oppose women bishops, and he rejects claims that this would relegate them to second-class status. Now, I don't see this as a rejection of my Episcopal ministry or making me a second-class citizen bishop. I don't see that, but rather as a way of gracious generosity and magnanimity. Besides, all ministry comes from Christ, and I rejoice that those parishes that have petitioned for extended Episcopal care receive the ministry of Christ that feeds them. But the Bishop of Gloucester disagreed. Michael Parham said the draft legislation already represented compromise and demonstrated huge sacrifice by supporters of women bishops. He pointed out it had already received support from a large number of dioceses. The Synod and the House will be seen to have been deaf to the Church if they endorse any significant departure from the draft legislation. The worst possible outcome of all our deliberations would be for the legislation to go down at final approval. That will be a missional disaster, and I don't doubt would mean a hemorrhaging of women from the church's life and ministry. He said that if the Manchester Amendment succeeded, it would leave supporters of women bishops unable to vote at the last hurdle for something they've longed for, worked for, and believed the church needed desperately. Canon Jane Charman warned that too much protection for traditionalists could lead to the Church of England splitting in two. The effect of the Manchester motion would be to part the last strands that bind us together. We may continue to inhabit the same geographical territory in our dioceses. We may share financial and administrative structures. We may come together under one roof as a synod. We may use the same language about mission. But we will have no ministry in common. We will be one organisation but we will no longer be one church. The General Synod did what it does best. It fudged. It rejected the Manchester motion, and it also rejected a motion from Southwark Diocese calling for the bishops not to amend the legislation at all. In the end, it merely asked them to go away, to think again about the legislation, but not to introduce substantial change. The bishops are free to do what they want. They're not bound by the decision of Synod. But the compromise appears to have pleased everybody, both in the chamber... David Holding again. I believe we're in a much more helpful place than we were because what we have done is to open a window that gives us a chance of holding the church together in the way that we are seeking to do. And over tea and biscuits in the Synod Cafe. Christina Rees is the former chair of Pressure Group Watch, Women and the Church. Well, this is the outcome that I think most people were hoping for and most people expected, particularly if you looked at how the diocese voted. Because back in 1992, when women were ordained as priests and that vote went through, only 38 out of the 44 dioceses 
overall voted in favour. And this time, 42 out of 44 dioceses voted in favour. And so it shows that really, the membership of the Church of England, I think is just saying, my goodness, are you still debating that? Would you please get on with it? And the Reverend John Dunnett, who chairs the Evangelical Group on General Synod, which has widely differing views on the issue. I think there is a widespread aspiration, and certainly amongst evangelicals, that the House of Bishops will be able to bring something back that will enable a greater degree of unity to exist, not just now, but going forward for years to come. If the bishops do amend the legislation, a group of six senior synod members, including the archbishops of Canterbury and York, will have to decide if the change is substantial. If it is substantial, the process will be delayed by at least a year as dioceses will have to be consulted again. If the change isn't substantial, the Synod could give approval in July, with the first women bishops likely to be ordained in 2014. Whatever they decide, the pressure for a conclusion is building, not least from younger members of Synod, as youth representative Hannah Page explained. Whilst the Church of England Youth Council recognises the importance of these debates and discussions surrounding the legislation, we are sick and tired of hearing the same things over and over again. And there comes a point when we need to stop talking about women bishops and homosexuality and the Anglican Communion Covenant and start talking about Jesus. Hannah Page ending Gavin Drake's report.